So, um, so Martin has been working for nine years in Project A, has built data warehouses in like more than 40 companies in the portfolio now. Uh, we consider him our data guru and um, we are very happy to hear his opinion on modeling and building data warehouse. So I give it to Martin, please. Yeah. Ah, one more thing. Uh, uh, I encourage everybody to keep the session as interactive uh, as possible. So please raise your hand uh, in Zoom if you want to ask a question. And also you can use the chat of asking questions that uh, we'll collect and, and post it to Martin later on. Yeah. Martin, please. Thank, thanks, Kirill. So this is a presentation I have been given numerous times uh, on whiteboards or on, on paper, on, on tables. Uh, right, so with uh, onboardings of, of many of you or other data engineers uh, in, in our portfolio. Uh, and the last weeks I was uh, trying to put them on slides. Uh, so mainly that this uh, knowledge exists somewhere uh, outside of my head. And uh, as Kirill said, today going to be uh, more on the business side of modeling. So it's going to be a pure syntactic exercise of how to derive, how to derive business questions. And tomorrow going to be technical. Right. So today I want to tell you the, the, this index card metaphor of mine, which is a metaphor or a kind of mental model for deriving analytical entities from business questions. This will help you with two questions. First of all, if you have a request that somebody wants to know somebody, uh, it, it will help you to decide whether you can answer the, the question with the data that you have. And it helps you kind of how exactly to extend the data models that you have in a data warehouse in order to be able to, uh, to answer the business question. Uh, we will not cover today uh, any kind of technical aspects of building all of this. This will come tomorrow. So I guess all of you work somehow in, in data and you all uh, at some point had the situation that somebody came to you and said, I want a dashboard. Uh, and I want it in some reporting tool like Tableau, Power BI, Looker, Data Studio or Metabase. And I, the input I give you is some Excel or Google Sheet that I have or some other uh, idea that uh, I want to, uh, to be uh, shown in a dashboard. And that's very important. I want the data to be updated every hour or every day or every other time frame uh, that is uh, uh, suitable for, for the question at hand. Right, so that's, that's the normal life of a data person that somebody uh, wants some data to be, to be um, automatically visualized somewhere. And yeah, and then they say, okay, let's do that. And later, uh, then the big question, how to actually do it. And the answer as always is you can either do that quick and dirty or correct and scalable. So what does that mean? Uh, Right, so all you all know, uh, and we, in fact, we as Project A also encourage that in the beginning, uh, uh, don't build a data warehouse, uh, use a Google Sheet or an Excel or whatever else, or, uh, or use a data studio on top of a database to, to get your insights uh, very quickly. And that's totally fine, right? So that's what many people who start um, uh, their data journey, they, they take a reporting tool like Tableau uh, or Power BI or whatever, and put them, connect them directly to, to their backend database. Um, then maybe also have then some random manual CSV files that they ingest. And some tools like uh, Power BI or Tableau also have then direct connectors to things like Google Analytics to, to, to ingest more data. That's very fine. Uh, uh, and, uh, and then, well, once there is a problem with this direct connection or if you have data volumes that you cannot connect directly anymore, like for example, if you have large amounts of events that you want to analyze, uh, or you have other complications, then people start introducing a central data store, right, which is just a database uh, where you move in, where you replicate your application databases, uh, where you then upload your CSV files that you have, where you ingest all your events, and maybe also then use a tool like Stitch or five trend to connect data, uh, so to, to ingest data from your marketing partners. Right, so some people also call it data lake, but it's basically 
a copy of the of the data that you have in your company and then you put your reporting tool uh, on top of that right so in both cases there is no modeling going on or there is modeling in the reporting tool um, and if you do that then there is the problem that the so-called single source of truth is very really hard to maintain right so uh, it's it's it, it, it's very easy to have then different business logic like so for example the definition of revenue uh, across different charts dashboards or team right so uh, one person might uh, use um, uh, 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 well, might exclude some orders from from revenue and other person might not one person uh, might uh, uh, include test orders another person might not uh, one person might uh, remove uh, cancellations another person might not so as right so as soon as, as uh, business logic lives in individual charts or dashboards then it's very likely to diverge um, also, if you have things like revenue, then and uh, it, it's directly uh, defined as queries uh, on some some data lake, then it's very likely that the revenue on the level of transactions is very different than the level of the at the level at the revenue at the level of customers, for example, right? So that then people look in different parts of your um, reporting tool and see per four a month different numbers for for revenue. Also. Uh, reporting tools are not good at being transparent. So, right, so if, if you see somewhere a chart that has revenue by day, then it's, uh, well, I think at least for me, it's hard to see how it was computed and where it was come from. And, and also it's, it's hard to, well, to, to, to really exactly understand uh, the, the, the intuitions that people had when they defined a metric, because it's usually ad hoc in the definition of a chart uh, or a dashboard. And with all of that together, um, right, so people see different numbers for the same time period uh, in different parts of your reporting tool. There's a high risk when you do that, that you lose stakeholder trust. Um, yeah, there is one exception that is, um, that is Looker. Looker has this, um, uh, that has this LookML schema in between uh, uh, your reporting tool and your data sources, where you can have some sort of single source of truth by exactly mapping out what revenue means and what an order is and so on. Uh, did somebody have a question? No. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. First, thanks a lot for this uh, presentation. It looks wonderful already. Um, I'm just uh, kind of confused. Uh, I don't understand. What, I still don't understand why a single source of truth is hard to maintain. I mean, obviously, uh, you have the different dashboards and different logics, but this, but the source is the same, right? So. Why, why, why is it hard to maintain when things are just using it differently? Well, if you directly connect to your backend database, right? So then you have to do some cleaning, right? So you have to maybe filter out some test orders. Uh, you have to decide whether you include cancellations or not. And so there are there is business logic in your in your dashboarding tool, and that will very likely diverge across different parts of your reporting tool. Right? because it has to be repeated uh, uh, over and over in, in different um, uh, parts of your, of your reporting tool. Yes, but, but, then, but then what's hard is to maintain the, the reporting tool itself, right? Or? No, I mean, that's, I mean, that's a good start and it's, it's easy to do, but the problem will be, uh, so the, high, the risk of that is losing trust because um, people will not trust the data that you have because it's not consistent in itself. And if you don't have that problem, then this approach is uh, absolutely fantastic, right? Because you don't, then you don't need to kind of model data. Okay. Yeah. I think it will become obvious a, a bit later on. Yeah. Yeah. So. Thanks. Business logic in the reporting tool is also hard to scale with business complexity and team size, right? So business complexity is if you not only measure orders or customers, but lots of other processes around, like activities of sales agents, calls to a call center, a marketing uh, sessions that happen somewhere, and, 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 right, or changes to transactions, changes to, to products. And uh, right, so in a, in a, in a, in a transactional business, you can easily have 50 or more analytical entities and uh, well, and that adds a lot of complexity. Uh, also, team size is basically when your data team grows more than one to, to more than one person who maintains dashboards. 
uh, right? And uh, uh, so if, if you have lots of business logic and lots of entities uh, and you want to change your definition of revenue, then, uh, well, then some poor soul has to go through all the charts that use the definition uh, and change it. Um, and it's, it's very likely that a person will forget that. Also, if you want to then uh, have consistency uh, or kind of how different people in the data team uh, define revenue, you have to do that by convention, right? So you maybe have to write down what filters uh, to, to set for um, uh, in when you want to have revenue for, 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 for a, given, a given time period. Um, also, uh, it then usually uh, um, gets messy when you want to join data, right? So you want to, for example, combine session information from your tracking tool with transactions from your backend. Uh, so this is then uh, often hard to do in Tableau or in reported tools, although they all have some way of, 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 of doing that, but with, uh, with quite some limitations. And, and that's, that's the third part of why it is not a good idea, is that if you have your business logic in the reporting tool, then the data is siloed there. Right? So, in Tableau or Power BI, it's very hard to uh, extract row level data, uh, but you, you might want to use uh, somewhere else. Right? So if you want to use the revenue uh, per customer uh, to do some machine learning or to, to, to fill or to, to drive your CRM tool, then uh, it's, although some of the tools provide that, it's hard to get it out again with the definitions that you have there. And that's why then, uh, uh, this is what we see very often that then uh, data science teams or machine learning teams or marketing automation teams uh, do then their own modeling where they then kind of create another reality of what revenue is uh, or what uh, customers are uh, so that they can um, um, use that data for things like predictions, recommendations or for, for automation of CRM and so on. Um, what you can also then do uh, if, if you have these problems of joining or if you have performance problems is that, uh, um, well, you, you take a data lake and then create some views or kind of some kind of ad hoc materialized tables uh, on top of these, uh, uh, this, this raw data and, and then use them in reporting tools. And right, so basically if, if you find it difficult uh, in, in, in the reporting tool to do a certain analysis with the tool itself, you basically prepare the analysis, create a view specifically for that uh, so that, that you can visualize it later, right? Uh, and these, these views you can either create manually or um, uh, with, with some tool that, that, that manages those. Um, if you do that, then you basically have the same problems as the first two options, but with the additional text, uh, technical complexity uh, that first of all, you have now uh, the business logic separated between the reporting tool and uh, your database. And you need some, some ways for, for updating these views or maintaining them. Uh, and if you materialize things, then you need something that runs every hour to, to schedule some, some queries. So my overall um, recommendation here is that these options uh, for, for this, all these three options are a good start, but they won't scale with business complexity and team size. Is there questions? Good. So what to do instead? Uh, and this is what uh, this whole session today and tomorrow is going to be about. It's kind of then applying uh, data warehousing best practices. And, uh, and, and all the things that I'm going to say today are more or less uh, 30 year old uh, methodologies or, um, or techniques that are still state of the art or become again state of the art, right? So I think so maybe five years ago or four years ago with the, the, uh, the, the hype of big data, people started uh, saying, okay, we don't need to model data at all. We just put everything in the data lake and then we go. But people now rediscover that uh, data itself that is, uh, it sits somewhere uh, uh, is, is not the best tool for, for, for uh, uh, driving a company. And uh, right, so the, the whole goal of uh, or building a data warehouse is not the ingestion of data in the central data repository, but it's this, uh, this kind of unified analytical model or truth uh, that is then built on top of the raw data that you have. And then that's then activated across the whole company. 
right? So you use this the data that you that you modeled or that you um, that you prepare not only for reporting, but you also use it for machine learning, for predictions, recommendations, uh, and 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 for pricing, or you use it for marketing automation that you upload contribution margins to your marketing partners, that you um, upload uh, rich customer profiles to your CRM tool. And, and, and right so reporting is only one consumer of this um, of your data warehouse then and um, no matter who in the company uses the data always then has the same definition of orders customers uh, and revenue um so if you then delve uh, into that topic then uh, uh, you often heard it hear the term dimensional modeling and we will come later to uh, uh, to what that is uh, you will also hear the term Kimball. So Kimball wrote a book in the early 90s that's called um, the, um, the Data Warehousing uh, Cookbook, I think. I'll, I'll have a slide later. Um, and uh, yeah, so, uh, so many of the things I'm going to tell today uh, are about this. Right? So you, um, you bring the data into a uh, a representation where it's arranged in the star or snowflake schema, we will come to that. It's normalized, uh, that means um, that, that the information is not repeated uh, and assigned to the, to, the, to the right tables or entities. It has referential integrity, we will also come to that, uh, and, 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 well, and has a consistent name. Um, the, the advantage of doing that is that you more or less automatically uh, with some uh, limitations, get the single source of truth and also some sort of um, uh, conceptual clarity, right? Because if you do dimensional modeling, then you more or less have to have exact definitions of, of your entities, of, of their attributes uh, and metrics, because somehow you need to decide what to do when you build this. And this has the really nice side effect that uh, it forces a company to agree on how to think, how they think about a business process, right? So uh, what exactly revenue is for them, what exactly customers are, what other transactions are, uh, and so on. We will come to that. Um, also, it enables you to do some sort of central uh, quality data quality management, right? So where um, you, you, you detect data quality problems very on. And it enables consistency and correctness. So that's, uh, for me, one of the hardest, but also more import most important parts of uh, building a data warehouse. And eventually, it's, it's kind of the basis for that the organization uh, trusts the data that you have, and thus uh, then also starts acting in a data-driven way. Right? So if you build something uh, that the organization does not trust, then it's very unlikely that your company will become data-driven. Um, also, if you do dimensional modeling, right, so you have this picture there on the bottom, then it's, for me, it's a really great communication tool between stakeholders uh, and, and, and engineers, because uh, this kind of schema or uh, um, uh, uh, entity model can be, can be drawn on the paper or on a whiteboard, but also directly visualized from a database. So it's something that you can do purely conceptually. And today we're gonna do it only on paper, but you can also do it in a database. And that makes it a really nice um, common visual language between uh, people who are on the business side and people who are more on the technical side of, of building this, right? So uh, if, if I see uh, a, a kind of ticket or a specification, that somebody wants to have some data. Uh, I, I use this um, this kind of mental model of this uh, of this um, entity relationship diagram to 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 this to kind of map that into something that uh, I can build. Um, also, uh, if you do proper dimensional modeling, then it's easy to get automatic documentation out of it, uh, right? Which makes data lineage easier. So, if you see such a picture and people have the question. What is revenue per um, uh, per product category? It's easy to 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 kind of think about it. What what that means, rather than when it's some random ad hoc queries uh, in a database. And um, and well, so this um, this is a rather abstract. But uh, I think if you do proper dimensional modeling, then it's easier to scale with business complexity and the size of a data team. So. Um, Right, because uh, extending or changing a dimensional model 
uh, is easier uh, 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 than when, when you have random SQL queries that sit somewhere or random filters in a dashboarding tool. It's also, at least I think so, uh, easier to read. Right? So if, if it's uh, eventually it will become a bunch of SQL queries uh, and, it will, and if you follow some sort of conventions uh, and some sort of best practices, then people usually without having written the code themselves know what to do when, when they have to extend it. Right? So it's, and so it's easier to, to onboard team members uh, and or, or also to distribute the work uh, on a dimensional schema uh, across multiple team members or even multiple teams. Um, and I think also uh, if you do that, uh, you have to have at least a chance to stay very agile to, uh, so to, to have faster development cycles uh, and, and have a more robust and stable system compared to uh, always putting out fires and fixing ad hoc stuff. Um, there's, a, there's a big disclaimer. Um, so if you do dimensional modeling, uh, then it requires discipline and it needs to be done well, right? So um, if you start building a data warehouse uh, where you do some modeling and then you have somebody who kind of just clutches then more queries uh, on top of that and, uh, and, and basically not follows any best practices and I would say basically hacks things around it, then it will become uh, actually more difficult to change things and then you will have more complexity and technical depth than without doing technical modeling, right? So the, you get the benefits only uh, if, if, if you do it uh, so-called well. Is there a question so far? Good. Then let's come to this. Um, Sorry, Martin. Uh, I am. I, I, I mean the, mm -hmm. I'm not so quick to, to, to unmute. Just one question. Uh, if you have uh, the situation of the, the, the first situation, I don't know if it's the first stage or something like this in your company, mm -hmm. uh, how you move uh, from the first to the fourth step? Uh, or these are steps or, or only stages or something that uh, you can, uh, uh, let's say, jump uh, uh, and uh, move on. Because uh, in some cases, uh, the, the third uh, situation can be a sort of uh, uh, approaching step to the modeling. I don't um, know if, uh, if it's a... Uh, yes, so, so this thing with, uh, uh, with, with doing, uh, so right, so here, um, Right, so the part uh, where you do this, right? So that, that can be a start into the modeling uh, and uh, right, and it's still better than nothing. Uh, th there is a big danger that if different teams create random ad hoc views and then people start steering their business based on those. So there is always the risk as soon as you have some sort of working reporting, it's very hard to kill and replace with something else. So that's, that's the only danger, but I mean, everything that keeps you going uh, is good, I would say. And yes, there are clear stages. So it doesn't make sense uh, for a company that has only three customers to do any kind of modeling and also not for a company that has 30 customers. Uh, so there needs, okay. to be, there needs to be an actual pain, um, but also, uh, uh, right, so that's, that's, that's a difficult discussion when to start all of this, but uh, sometimes people start too late. Right? So when uh, people then get overwhelmed with ad hoc requests and, and, and data teams are only fighting fires in these um, uh, ad hoc queries and then don't, uh, are not proactive anymore. Yeah. Uh, you, consider, you can consider that uh, in our company, in the, we were six months uh, ago in the first stages. Now mm. we are in the second stages uh, and now we want to move uh, directly from the, the second to the fourth stage. So it's, uh, uh, the, the question was about it because uh, it uh, can be useful uh, but risky to move in uh, middle stages where uh, the, let's say, the, um, uh, the, the department that are owner of this, the specific entity or the specific uh, uh, understanding of the business can create uh, the, um, uh, a sort of glossary for all the company about this definition. Yes, so that's a good approach. So if you have business logic and a reporting tool that you have SQL snippets 
that you can can paste and then adapt them yeah. for your needs. Yeah. So that's good. I think Hank, you still you still you have that at Katawiki as well, right? Okay. Thank you. Yeah. 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 That's that's then well that's then kind of uh, consistency by convention. And the convention is everybody has to look into the catalog. Yeah, yeah. Alexei, you also had a question. Uh, yeah, um, just maybe a more general one. As you uh, started with the slide uh, of the uh, data warehouse uh, best practices, mm -hmm. um, you started with uh, some like global sentence about. Uh, that like there was a hype on big data and then there was like an idea like probably putting just data into some data lake or whatever and not doing data modeling. I'm not, not sure if I got it right or were you just like yes. talking about SQL and NoSQL uh, databases? Well, I think both, right? So, um, so, so the, I think the, so the term data warehouse itself is, um, uh, well, also I think a bit, a bit out of fashion, uh, but we, I think we don't haven't found a better good name yet. Um, but I, I would say with with the with the with, well with the rise of Spark and Hadoop, people uh, kind of rather focused on topics of ingestion uh, than than on on actual modeling. Right? And then I think got lost often in technology. Right. So also in Berlin, we have seen many companies who use then real time big data technology to build a twenty gigabyte data warehouse. Uh, which is ridiculous and uh, yeah but we will come tomorrow about then uh, 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 how to build this the other questions okay then um uh, let's come back to your boss who wants to have a dashboard and let's say more precisely he comes to you and says i want to know revenue and i want to know it per payment method and day and I also want to know voucher usage, right? So take that as a kind of a minimal requirements engineering uh, or a minimal uh, stakeholder request. And so what do you have to do then, right? So your task is to do several things uh, when you do this, this dimensional modeling. First of all, if the question is about revenue, uh, you, have to, and you have to identify the, the underlying business processes uh, and the entities that create revenue. That sounds simple, but in practice, it is often not, right? So in a traditional uh, uh, e-commerce business, uh, if you want to know the revenue of a company, you look at the orders that are in your backend, right? But if you are a more traditional merchant, uh, right, where you can order by fax and, 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 and by phone, then the orders don't matter too much. There's then rather the invoices that sit in your ERP. Or if you are a subscription business, then the revenue uh, of your company, well, it's hard to tell, but usually it's then rather the payment iterations that end up on your bank account. Or if you are a B2B uh, uh, software as a service business, then it's a wild mix of invoices, uh, things in your back end uh, and, and, and some subscription iterations. Right, so this, this you have to figure out uh, kind of um, what is my single source of truth that I want to base uh, uh, revenue on, right? Or if you have uh, uh, things like, I don't know, funnels, uh, or you want you have uh, things like customers, then you need to, do, you need to define them. Uh, also, uh, and we will see why this is super important, um, you have to, bit, have to anticipate a bit what the business questions are that your stakeholders currently have or will have in the future related to revenue, uh, right? Because this has big consequences uh, on how to uh, 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 model things, right? So, the, uh, so you basically you kind of find out how do people want to steer their business? How do they want to do marketing budget allocation? How do they want to optimize uh, logistics? Uh, and this, is the, uh, this has then big consequences on, on how you model things. Uh, and you have to then, uh, with your stakeholders and across uh, your organization, find good names uh, and, and definitions, right? So in every company, there is something that has an email address uh, and you can call that user, you can call that customer, uh, you can call that contact if it's uh, an employee uh, in, in a company. Uh, you you can, can call that lead uh, if it's, uh, if it's um, 
that's, that's, that's a funnel, right? So, but you, you need to kind of uh, agree uh, in your company how um, uh, you want to call the thing that has an email address uh, that you interact with, right? Or you have to define what revenue is. Is it with or without test orders? Is it before or after cancellations? What, what is in it? What, what is out of it? Uh, and uh, so, so all of this uh, you have to do before, before you start building things. And then once, once you have that, so you have these requirements, these names uh, and, and the business questions, then it's about finding a, a general representation for answering all business questions that you might have, um, uh, um, that you might have about, about revenue at once. Uh, right? And so today is mainly uh, a, a kind of, well, I uh, will to try to help you of, of how to find these general representations. And there are different names for that, right? Uh, so um, many people nowadays use dimensional model uh, uh, or, or some people, so a dimensional model is basically where you have so-called fact tables and dimension tables uh, and they together uh, create a so-called star schema, uh, but we will come to that later. Uh, I personally like the term cube uh, because it has this notion of uh, multi-dimensional multi-dimensionality, but um, we stopped at Project A, we stopped using the term cube because it's perceived as too old school, um, right? It's, it's associated with uh, BI tools like Microsoft Analysis Services or Cognos or, or MicroStrategy uh, fr from the 90s. And so people think it's, it's something that lives in, in these tools. Uh, and so to avoid confusion, we stopped using the term uh, cube uh, already a while ago. My personal preference nowadays is to speak of data sets, right? So it's the same thing, uh, but for me, it's then uh, entities that are connected uh, and have metrics. Um, yeah, so, right, so now your boss wants to know revenue. And uh, uh, from, well, and so I, I want to give you a metaphor that makes it for you very easy to uh, uh, how to, to model these business questions. So for me, uh, if I think about those, um, uh, I often think of a data set or a so-called cube as a stack of cards, right? So physical cards. Um, and some of you know that in, in the past I was doing this exercise here now with actual physical cards on a table. That's currently not possible uh, with Corona, unfortunately. Um, and, right, and so there, in, in, in this card metaphor, there are only four rules. The first of uh, that, the first one is that each card of uh, well, each with each of these cards has a fixed set of fields, and, and then there are three allowed operations. The one is simple aggregations on single fields. The second one is filtering, and the third one is grouping. Uh, let's come to the, an, an actual example. So, uh, uh, right, so. Um, if you have, let, let's do an e-commerce case where you have orders and then uh, you create one card for, e for each order that uh, ever happened uh, in your business. So here we do only three because otherwise it might be a, a bit exhausting. Uh, and what you do is you do, you put data on fixed fields, right? So here is the order ID with the, or the order with the ID one, here is order two, and here is order three. Then you have a field for the customer ID. So this was customer one, this was customer two, and this was customer one again. Then this, uh, then you put some sort of date on it. And of course you don't write there Monday, but you do a nice uh, uh, UTC uh, time zoned timestamp. I'm just to, to make it shorter, I wrote here Monday. This uh, order happened on Wednesday, and this one also happened on Wednesday. And uh, well, because somebody wanted to know per payment method, you say this order was was paid via PayPal. This will be paid via invoice, and this was also paid by PayPal. And lastly, uh, this order had a card value of ten euro. This also of ten euro, and this had a card value of thirty euro. Right. So you you take the information that you have and that you want to analyze uh, and put it onto um, uh, uh, fixed fields uh, of these cards, and you write them down. And also, you don't worry about normalization yet, so it's, it's just fields on cards. Then, 
the first load operation is to do simple aggregations on single fields. And with simple aggregations, I mean actually only things like sum averages, counts, and distinct counts. So we rarely seen in the project A portfolio that people use other aggregations than those. And um, right, so you can, can define the number of orders as the count of the order ID. So you go through all these cards uh, uh, and uh, apply a count on this order ID field. So here we have three orders. Or you have the revenue. So basically you, you go for each of these cards uh, and sum the, ca the card value. So overall the revenue here is uh, 50 euro. Or if you want to have something like the average card value, that would be the average uh, of this uh, same field. Uh, right? So again, you go for each card, you count them, do the sum, and then um, uh, divide them. Um, right? So that's 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 very simple. Um, it's it's easy to understand. Um, it's easy to compute in a database. So databases are good at uh, aggregating. Uh, it's also easy to parallelize, right? So you could imagine a database having these orders uh, in different partitions for the one partition for each day. So you could kind of um, count the number of orders or you compute a revenue for Monday separately from for Wednesday and then afterwards uh, 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 combine those results. And you can also do things like pre aggregations where you take the metrics and, and create an aggregate table. Uh, or, or something in memory that has already the revenue per day uh, pre-computed. Um, of course, uh, that, that's usually not enough. So you want to have complex things like contribution margins or, uh, or, or revenue, which are a rich combination of, of other metrics. And, uh, and these you can, of course, build uh, on top of these simple applications, right? So then in your reporting tool that you say the contribution margin is the revenue minus the cost of goods sold minus minus minus. Um, yeah, All right. So that's the first operation you do. The second operation is uh, filtering out cards. Uh, right. So if you want to know the revenue on Tuesday, then uh, you go for each card. Uh, uh, sorry, the revenue on Wednesday. You go for each card, check whether it's on Wednesday. So the first card is not on Wednesday. The second card is on Wednesday. The third card is on Wednesday. Then you apply your simple aggregation. Uh, in this case, the sum of the card value. So the, uh, the revenue on Wednesday uh, is 40 euro. Right, so that's all very easy. The third allowed operation is grouping. Um, that, uh, wait, so if you want to know the average card value per payment method, what you do is you go through all your cards uh, and put them on different stacks depending on the thing that you want to group, right? So you, for example, here the, the, um, uh, the last card goes on this stack, it's the PayPal stack. Here you have the invoice stack, and this one also goes to the PayPal stack, uh, right? And uh, then you basically apply your aggregations. So the average card value for PayPal is 20 euro and the average card value for invoice is 10 euro. Right, so these are super simple aggregations. So you, you write things on your cards and then you take your cards, always take one card off the stack, decide whether you filter it out or not. Maybe build sub stacks um, if you want to group and then apply aggregations. Right, so that's very, very simple um, um, operations that are there. And they are so simple um, because imagine uh, doing that with millions of cards. Right, so going for each card, building substacks, aggregating, um, and uh, right, and so you could do that. So if we were would be sitting in a room, uh, and I would have here a stack with uh, two thousand cards about orders, I could get, give each of you a stack uh, of one hundred cards, tell you to to do the the filtering, grouping, uh, and an aggregation, and afterwards we would com combine the results into to a final result. Right, so this is um, also how databases work. This is also how reporting often was done on actual index cards before we had computers. Right, so if people wanted to, well, count things, for example. Um, and right, so the, the, this metaphor is, is, is a kind of analogy for you to, to mentally keep things uh, very, very simple. Is there questions about this? Hopefully, it will become a bit more clear when we also talk to what's then 
kind of implicitly not allowed. Right, and the first thing that is not allowed with with and when you only have uh, fixed fields, simple aggregations, uh, filtering, and grouping, is to looking at other cards. Right, for example, if you want to know whether an order um, is the first or second order of a customer, uh, right, so then you start have to look at at at, at other cards to figure out what uh, uh, what. Um, was the first right so you have a stack of of one million orders uh, and what you would first have to do is you would have to kind of uh, group them first by customer then sort each stack by the order date and then take the first one off the stack right which is a much much more heavy operation uh, than than just in parallel going through these stacks and uh, so and what in reporting to you could do stuff like to take the rank over a partition by customer ID and order by day, right? So that's possible, uh, and well, a reporting tool can do that. But uh, as I said before, uh, so these things are then hard to pre-aggregate. So you can uh, not, not easily build uh, um, uh, uh, aggregate tables for that. It's computationally really heavy, so you have to go through. Uh, well, so you first have to do this partitioning. <laughs> Uh, and again, you will have a business logic and a reporting tool if you do those. Much simpler. I am. Karim, you have a question? Uh, yeah. Uh, sorry, why is it not allowed? I mean, I understand it's heavy, but why is it not allowed? Oh. For these reasons. So it's business logic and a reporting tool. Uh, uh, it, it, it can be slow. Uh, and uh, uh, and you have it. Well, if you wanted to use then the order rank somewhere else, for example, in your marketing attribution, then you cannot because it's living in your reporting tool. Okay. I see. What you what you do instead, uh, and this is always the solution to everything today, is you pre-compute in your data set, right? So the query on the left, you run that, uh, and right. If you run it in your ETL, then you have all the time in the world to do that, and you basically create another field. Um, uh, on your order card that is, says what the rank of the order is. So this, the first one is the first order of the customer one. This is the first order of customer two. Uh, and this is the second order of customer one. Yeah. Um, the second thing that is not allowed um, is what I call here complex aggregations or business logic. Right? So for example, if somebody wants to know how many orders had a voucher, so this order here had a voucher value of five euro. This order had no voucher. And this order had a voucher value of 10 euro. Then uh, you could easily do something uh, in your reporting tool, like when the voucher value is not null, then one else zero. Uh, and it has, this, it has similar problems as the, as the one before with looking at other fields that is again, difficult to pre-aggregate. It's also often difficult to push down to a database, um, right? So that uh, we, so simple aggregations like count, distinct counts, sums, and averages can be computed in SQL in the database. Uh, often, for these kind of logics, a Tableau or Power BI has to get all rows, um, of, so has, has to get all orders out of the database, uh, and then apply this this logic in memory which makes it uh, kind of by, by, by many magnitudes slower than if, if you can do so-called push down computation to the database, right? So where the actual computation happens in, uh, in the database. And again, you have business logic and the reporting tool, which I would say is in general, as you maybe heard already, undesirable. And again, the solution is to pre-compute that in a data set. So basically you create another field that is, uh, um, that right, so basically says this is the number of orders with vouchers, and it's one when there was a voucher, it's zero or null um, when there was none. I always prefer null, but uh, depends on, on the business question. And here again, it's one for, for, for this order that had a voucher. Yeah, Karim. Okay, yeah, sorry. Uh, so, I mean, uh, in some slides back, you had this uh, like uh, the the, the 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 data warehouse modeling so we have the data sources different data sources and then you have the central data store right mm -hmm. and then you have the single analy analytical truth mm -hmm. right? and then you have the reporting tool and stuff 
Mm-hmm. Right? So now, what 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 is? Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so now, when we're talking about the not allowed stuff, like the heavy stuff, mm-hmm. we it is not allowed in the reporting tool, <clears throat> right? Yes. Okay, but it's allowed in the data set. So the data set is the central data store or is it the single analytic, analytical truth? Oh, it's a single analytical truth. Right? So the central data store is raw data as, as is from your source systems. And here we are talking about the single analytical truth, right? So these are stack of cards uh, in the metaphor. Okay, yeah, yeah I just, didn't want, just wanted to be sure. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Um, okay, then Let's come to the third we, model. We have yeah. another question, Martin. Yeah, please. Martin, uh, maybe another question for the complexity of these cards. Uh, let's assume that a typical business question is not uh, so straightforward, like count of vouchers uh, or orders with voucher or not, but let's say uh, count, uh, we need to know uh, how many vouchers uh, or, or order of the voucher out of all customers coming from Australia. So multiple dependencies for the card. What shall we yeah. do in this case? Well, uh, so this is what you have this card metaphor for, right? So uh, coming from Australia, right? So then you need to think about what does coming for Australia mean for orders, right? So is it is it where kind of the, is it the source of the, of the marketing sessions? Is it, and then if there are multiple, is it the first, the last, or the most frequent one? Is it the delivery address of the customer? Uh, is it then the first, last, or, or the current one? Right. So it's it's um, coming from Australia. Uh, right. So it's something that somebody wants to know, and this uh, this 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 modeling forces you to exactly say uh, to define what it means. So basically, if I have a complex condition. Um, mm-hmm. that belongs to the order, like which is a representative of the card. It's a good idea to have this com- uh, condition actually defined still within data model and added to the card definition as additional column. Yes. Um, I mean, if it's if it's a super random thing that you only need on one dashboard, then you, of course, do it there. But if it's something fundamental, like uh, count- counting the number of orders with vouchers or counting the first orders and so on, then I would pre-compute it. Okay, um, what's also not allowed is to have multi-valued fields, right? So now your boss comes and also says, I want to know revenue per product, right? And then, okay, you could say the first order was for product one, the second order was for product two, uh, and then the third order uh, contained two products, namely product one and product two. And now you are a bit in trouble, um, uh, right? Because it's really difficult to do grouping with this, uh, with this third card. And so that's why it's not allowed. So it's unclear how to group. So if you group by product, uh, what do you do then with this third card? Do you put it on, do you duplicate it and put it on both stacks? What do you do with the revenue? What do you do with the voucher value? Uh, how you com- you compute your metrics? Um, and right, so it's totally unclear then what, what, what revenue then means uh, if, if you apply it to such a card. Uh, and that's also why reporting tools uh, don't allow this. So, Often you can filter on multi-valued fields, but you usually cannot group because it's um, it's kind of completely undefined what what uh, conceptually what what the, what the, what the results then are, right? And so, unfortunately, if uh, somebody wants to know the revenue per product, then uh, you are a bit in trouble. You then you have to change the granularity, uh, or sometimes it's also called the grain. Uh, of your cards from orders to order items, right? So basically you create a new data set that is then on the level uh, uh, of uh, of order items. So you take your your order number three uh, and you split that card into, uh, in this case, two other cards. So you you repeat, so so this is the, the order item three, this is the order item four, this is for product one, this is for product two. You repeat the order ID, it's in both cases, order number three. You repeat the customer ID, customer one. Then you have to do something with this card value. Uh, uh, right? So here you could say this one was 10 and 20 euro. 
that's usually easy because individual products have individual prices in a cart. Um, but um, it gets a bit more tricky when you have things like voucher value, because they usually you have voucher values at the level of orders, not of order items. And then you need to make an arbitrary decision of how to split that voucher value right, uh, in, your, in your data transformations. So you could say, I do the voucher value proportionally uh, to, the, to the price, that's, that's a good start, or you just uh, do it linearly, or sometimes vouchers are for specific product categories, then you can do it more specifically. Or you could even create a different order item if you have to, if you don't find a good solution uh, for, for the vouchers. Um, then uh, if you split this card, then counting can become difficult, right? So if you now want to count the number of orders, then you would start doing something like the number of orders is a distinct count. Uh, of the order ID, right? So in this case, it's one for this order. Uh, or if you want to count the number of orders with vouchers, you can't anymore sum uh, this metric column. So what you do is you repeat uh, the order ID uh, uh, and if the order had a voucher and then define the number of orders with vouchers as a distinct count uh, on uh, that column, right? So basically because you, you have you, you duplicate uh, data across cards, uh, it, it becomes more difficult and distinct counts are the solution here. Um, and then you repeat all the rest of your columns. Um, Karim, yeah. Um, when you say split, have you like literally split it like now in the day in the single analytical truth data set? Now yes. it has been two different entities. It's two different entities, uh, and uh, right, but so, isn't yeah. this a heavy, a heavy, uh, uh, a heavy process in itself? Like, imagine you have to split uh, millions of records, also. So now you have two. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we will come to that tomorrow. Um, so you don't split actual rows in the database. It's more conceptually. You split the grain of these cards, uh, and then have a different transformation that uh, create those. Uh, but what changing the transformation is a heavy operation. Right, um, because um, uh, right, so you you now have to have to start a different modeling, uh, and that's why I said earlier it's, it's super important that you kind of try to anticipate a bit upfront what business questions stakeholder might want to have, right? So you ask them, okay, you want to know revenue per payment method uh, and day, uh, but will it ever happen that you also want to know it by products? Right, and then, uh, well, then you validate. Uh, some, of course, they often will say yes, and then you validate uh, whether they really need to know revenue by product. But if they need to know, then um, you immediately build rather an order item data set than an order data set. Uh, right, so it's um, in, right, so you, you need to know this before. So, going, what's, what's the, the grain of the analysis? Uh, another thing is like, do you want to know the marketing cost only per campaign structure and day, or do you need to, need to, do you need to know it on individual sessions? It has big implications on, uh, uh, on, on, on the work for your data engineers and, and, and right? So it's, it's super important to think about before what, what your business questions are, because later doing such a split is costly. Um, or are there questions about it? No, uh, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, of course, nobody uses these paper cards uh, uh, to design uh, data sets. Um, uh, right, so these, these, it's, it's a pure uh, metaphor or mental model that, that will help you to, to, to um, keep your analytical model simple and, and, and general. Right, so when I see um, a, a, and I see business questions somewhere in a ticket, and I see, uh, 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 well, and, and I see uh, well, the entities and the relations between them. Uh, I can immediately um, see whether the business question is possible to answer with the data that I have or not. Right, and uh, also it, it forces you to, um, well, to think about what is the the source or the source country for an order and it, it forces you to think about how, how things stay in relation. And, and this is really, really helpful, uh, healthy, and I think a very valuable tool. Um, 
this is com so this is compared to I would say doing things in Excel. In Excel, you can easily do something like revenue per outside temperature and day maybe. Right, so you have one column uh, per day the revenue. You have another column by by day uh, the outside temperature, and then you just divide them by each other. Right, and so this is a mental model that many people that got to use to work with Excel have. In Excel, you divide or you combine arbitrary cells with each other in arbitrary ways. With this uh, dimensional modeling, uh, it's not that easy. So if somebody wants to know revenue per outside temperature, then you have to think about uh, what exactly does the outside temperature for an order mean? Is it the, the, the average temperature of a day when the order was placed? Is it when the order was delivered? Is it uh, the temperature in Germany overall? Is it the um, temperature at the, the, at the delivery address of the customer? And, and, and so you basically really have to think about how do I get uh, temperature on the card of an order and how do I get revenue of the card of an order? And that's, that's a hard uh, mental exercise uh, how to do that. But it will ensure that there's a single source of truth about uh, outside temperature related to orders. Um, this, so this, uh, yeah, so it's, it's a nice tool for you to, to, to think about business questions and entities. Uh, I would never uh, expose that metaphor to stakeholders, right? So uh, uh, if, if you tell them, uh, I cannot easily do outside temperature uh, per revenue or revenue per outside temperature because it's, uh, I cannot do that with my card metaphor then your data warehouse modeling will be perceived as a technical limitation, right? And so, um, uh, and, then, and then people will, um, so they, they don't care about your troubles about modeling. So they just want to know, uh, uh, well, uh, of course, sometimes it makes sense to say them it's stupid to do revenue per outside temperature, but they don't care about your, your internal modeling. So it's something that you do between your analysts, between the people who do requirements engineering, and any kind of people who build the representations in the data warehouse. Right, so, so that's that's this. So I hope I helped you to thinking in terms of these cards that you physically go through, that you um, uh, a filter a group and then aggregations helps you to to keep very simple and general representations. Um, and yeah, so I think we are really good in time. So then let's come to other common model, modeling problems that we, we've seen uh, in, the, in the project A portfolio. Um, and of course, I will not continue doing this with cards because it's a bit, um, well, take some time to prepare. And uh, also we, when we, just, when we discuss entities or data sets, we usually don't use cards, right? So it's more a mental metaphor. We of course use tables, right? So on a whiteboard, uh, in Excel, in a Google Sheet, etc. Right, so the same cards that we've seen before, you can, uh, of course, also uh, conceptualize them as a table with rows. So here are our three orders, and I will do that uh, from now on. So one thing uh, when, when you think about business processes, uh, uh, um, then it's, it's very often very, very kind of um, tightly connected to time, uh, right? So, most business processes happen over time uh, and, and you can conceptualize them very often a series of events, right? So an order is an event where somebody placed an order. A customer can be an event where somebody registered their email address at the backend. A product is an event where, um, uh, well, a product was created somewhere in, 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 in a product information system and an end, right? So most business processes um, um, result in events created by some business process uh, in the company. And these events can often have very different time perspectives. Uh, and this is, um, uh, can be confusing to, uh, to consumers of your data sets if they then have five different uh, timestamps uh, on, um, on the same entity, right? So for the orders, you could have something like the the date when the order was placed, but you can also have something like the first date of uh, the, 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 
the, the date of the first order of a customer, or you could do something like day when the order was shipped. Um, right, and it's, so it's very normal to, to have that, so to have multiple timestamps uh, uh, on, on a data set. Right, so here we have the, the, the same three orders as before. And then you could say, okay, we additionally have the first order date. So that's the date when the customer made the first order. So for the first order, it's on Monday. For the second order, it's on Wednesday. And for the third order, which happened on Wednesday, the first order date is Monday. Right? And so then you can do that. Uh, you can use that to do your uh, nice cohort graphs uh, with that. Um, or, um, and well, so for example, you can, can have something like a shipment date, uh, right? So this order uh, was shipped on Thursday. They are super hard to understand by users because if you filter your revenue by shipment date, then the overall sum of the revenue will be different from uh, the revenue by first order date or by, uh, by order date because it's partial, right? So not all uh, orders here have a shipment date yet. Uh, so that's, um, we typically try to avoid those uh, because they're really hard to understand uh, if people, so if basically if the, if the meaning of a metric changes uh, depending on which filters you use. So to, to, they have to be really careful that people do not get confused. Otherwise, right, so the message here, um, uh, uh, well, um, usually time is something where, where your business processes happened uh, over time, and it's okay to have multiple time perspectives. You just have to explain it really well to your stakeholders. Um, this, the second thing is, uh, right, so, so far we just talked about orders and customers, uh, but sometimes people not only wanna know what the last state of a customer or the last state of an order is, but they also want to see um, uh, or, or what the state of, of an entity uh, was uh, at a, a current point in time, or what, what when changes to these entities happened, uh, right? And so these, and this is because uh, in, in, a, in, a, in every company, statuses uh, of, of orders or attributes of products or categorizations of customers uh, or, or any kind of other object can change over time. So it's really normal. And sometimes people uh, want to know, look at these changes, right? So at the level of orders can be statuses, whether the order was placed, paid, shipped, returned, or refunded. Uh, for customers, you might want to look at final stages, right? So it was, it was, it was created, then maybe uh, marketing qualified, sales qualified, one and, and M, uh, right? So, People can change teams. That's often important if you want to look at performance of, of sales teams. And then, and so, and normally in the business, uh, entities change their properties somehow over time. Uh, and that needs to be reflected uh, in your analytical entities. Um, and there are two ways of doing that. One is uh, to, to, well, so, right, so if you have a thing like an order, then you also have an order event entity which is basically uh, then around the question, what happened to an entity over time? And one role uh, in such uh, a data set is then a change to the entity, right? So here you have uh, you know, the order one, uh, and then on Monday, the order was placed, on Tuesday it was paid, uh, on, on Thursday it was shipped, uh, right? And so then you basically, uh, you have uh, uh, in, in the stack of cards, status changes uh, to orders. And then you can do nice metrics. For example, you can compute the um, days since the order happened. You can also compute how long it was in the status and how long it took to the next status and and end. Um, if in, in reporting, uh, you usually have done some weird metric, which is something like number of order events, which is the count uh, of these cards. Um, right, and so then you could easily do, do a diagram of uh, how many different kind of status changes happen over time. Um, and because that's sometimes a bit um, not so nice for end users, you could even do something, uh, yeah, one second, you could even do something where you, um, you, you make it more explicit, where you do metrics for status changes, right? So you say here uh, on Monday, number of orders placed was one, on Tuesday, the paid orders number of paid orders was one, uh, and on Thursday, the number of shipped orders was one. Yeah, Karim, please. 
uh, it's me this time. Oh, Hello. sorry. Hi. So mm -hmm. uh, once I had to do this exercise, when uh, I had to calculate uh, the time spent in each stage, is there, I'm just wondering, is there a best practice to do so? Because I had to do this in Power Query and it was pretty painful. Um, as always, pre-compute uh, in your <laughs> data warehouse. Right, so it's it's a heavy operation because you have, again have to partition by the order ID, bring them an order, and then with a window function compute the difference to the previous one. Uh, and I would pre-compute that, and so put all the metrics that you want to have for these events, put them there. Uh, it makes uh, it easier in your reporting tool, and you can use them also elsewhere than in the reporting tool. Okay. Okay. I am Karim. Yeah, so I have, uh, I don't know if it's an engineering question or what. So what you said before, anticipate the questions that the customer will want, will, will ask, right? So mm -hmm. uh, the different queries that you would actually want to execute. So is there kind of a process before, uh, I mean, kind of a process that is like a meeting where the engineers and the, and the customers sit down and like they decide upon which queries they're going to show on their dashboard? Yeah. Uh, so. Yes, so that's the whole point of this modeling. Um, that uh, so, so far we are not building anything, uh, right? So we are building mental models, uh, and well, and you you don't discuss these mental models with your stakeholders, but it helps you to 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 model the business questions that your stakeholders have. And of course, you have lots of meetings uh, where you ask them. Ideally, you don't ask them what kind of chart do you want to build or what kind of dashboard. Uh, you ask them, what is your problem that you want to optimize? What is your business question, right? So uh, how can, and so what kind of data or information does your team need to optimize their, their processes or to create a better customer experience or to, uh, to, 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 to improve marketing efficiency and so on, right? And so you rather start from the business questions uh, or the, the things they want to optimize and then they derive these entities and dashboards. Right. So sometimes people come with an Excel where they say, I want, to, I want to have this chart. And then you have to do an additional round and understand why they were building this chart and, and how do they use it to, to, to improve the business. I see. Thank yeah. you. So it's like, uh, what I'm asking is like in terms of software engineering, for example, we have the requirements. Uh, ah, yeah, yeah. So here we are absolutely on the requirements engineering side. Yeah. Right, and so this whole index card metaphor is a tool to do do good requirements, right? right? So because it's a kind of perfect tool between uh, uh, more business oriented people and, and and more technical people. Yep. Okay. Right. So so if you have these uh, changes happening to entities, uh, right? In this case, to orders, then there is a problem. Um, you don't know, right? Because you, on, on Tuesday it was paid, on Thursday it was shipped. And here you don't know what the state of the order was on Wednesday, right? So it was because it has this event perspective, it has changes over time. But sometimes people want to know uh, what the status of an entity has been at any given uh, time, right? And so what you then do in this kind of history entity is that you do run one row per entity and every day since the, well, the first time this entity uh, appeared somewhere. Right, so now you have, again, the order one, and you have all days uh, since Monday uh, uh, um, uh, 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 in, in this table. And then uh, basically on days where nothing happened, you repeat the last uh, uh, status of the day. Right? So on Wednesday, so on Tuesday, the order became paid, and on Wednesday, it was still paid. Right? And so with this uh, um, granularity of an index, uh, you uh, you can can answer questions about what was the status or the quantity of stuff over time. You again can create these metrics, and if you want to, uh, you can again uh, have kind of um, uh, attribute specific metrics like number of placed orders, number of paid orders, and number of shipped orders. Yeah, Kareem, please. Uh, sorry, I forgot to lower. Okay. <laughs> As I just saw the raised hand. Okay, um, right. So, so these two are possible. Um, 
sometimes, uh, especially if you read um, uh, the Kimball, then uh, there is the notion of slowly changing dimensions. Uh, and uh, my take on slowly changing dimensions is that I would not do them um, and always solve them either with history tables or direct dimensions. Right. So if you have the case of that the shipment address of the customer or the address of the customer changed and you want to know, right, so a customer moves from country A to country B, then basically I would um, make the, the shipment address a direct property of the order table and not, uh, not indirectly via the customer. Or if the, um, if the sales agent uh, changes uh, its team uh, from one, uh, changes from one team to the other, and you look at um, uh, the performance of sales teams, then you basically make the, the team and the sales agent separate uh, kind of in, uh, um, uh, independent attributes of your uh, sales performance uh, uh, data set, right? Or uh, if, you, uh, if you have things like uh, changes in the status of products, then you make these fat product, uh, fat history tables where you have one role for each product since it was created. Uh, right? uh, these, these slowly changing dimension things were created when space and databases were scarce. But nowadays, it has become so cheap that it's usually absolutely not a problem to create tables that have one role per entity and date. So it's not, it's not at all a problem. Um, sorry, Jonas, you had a question. Well, I guess you, you just answered it. So I think a third way to model this would be a general key value store where you where you have um, as a key the entity then the field name and the changed value and and a timestamp but i think you just said yeah you, you wouldn't recommend it yeah i mean slowly changing dimension is that you have uh, you have a customer table and then you say uh, 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 and this this row in the table is valid from uh, from this state to this state, because after because afterwards uh, the, the the team set has changed, right? So basically, you have you have facts, and you in, in one part of the fact is from when from when to when it is valid, um, and this is does not really work well uh, with people who have to consume their data because then if they join these dimensions, uh, they they always have to um, uh, well. A, 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 Kind of uh, include the, the time range from when from when this information is valid. So it's it's hard to to first of all hard to build, hard to think about it for consumers, and well it can be done much easier with with history tables. So for me there is no need anymore to uh, to to model slowly changing dimensions. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Um, one thing right. So. Um, uh, often, so, so here you have to choose between this event perspective. So what are changes to orders uh, or histories? What was the status of something at a given time? And uh, you can combine those. Um, so this is a pattern that Selim from our team uh, did first, I think, at uh, Pets Deli a few years ago. Uh, right, so um, you, you can again call that history entity. And, and then you have both the, the state of an entity and changes to the entity in the same table. So again, also you have one row per entity and day. So here is the, as before, the, the history table. So four days. Um, on Tuesday, the order became paid. On, um, uh, on, on Wednesday, it still was paid. And what you, right, so this is the kind of uh, status perspective of the thing. But what you also can do is now say, okay, on Monday, the number of new placed or newly placed orders was one. Uh, on, on Tuesday, the number of newly paid orders was one. Then on Wednesday, nothing, nothing happens. Uh, and on Thursday, the number of newly shipped orders was also one, right? So where you have different metrics for the status uh, of something, uh, um, and, diff and, and, and different metrics for changes to the status. This is nice. Uh, so um, it's, it's, it, it often really can make sense, especially if you combine them, them with other metrics, right? So for example, if you have a FinTech, then uh, you have things like portfolios and they have values and they have assets under management and they have, they have 
uh, there are also metrics for kind of how much money is flowing out, how much money is flowing in, and you also have status changes. So it might make sense to to combine this uh, history perspective with the uh, event change uh, 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 perspective. Yeah. So, but we also have we don't have we haven't built that too often. Uh, but it's it's a nice thing to keep in mind because. Um, it, well, it, it, it's, it's more general and more powerful than having separate uh, event or history uh, entities. Um, yeah, and also it only works if you have a finite set of, set of states, right? So if you have 50 order item, uh, order statuses, then I wouldn't do that. Um, yeah, so much more difficult than changes to entities over time is changes to metrics over time. So let's say uh, the order two uh, from our example got canceled on Thursday, right? And so there are now many things you can do. The first one is you just remove the row from your stack of cards. Um, and well, and if you do that, of course it's possible. And uh, I've seen many companies doing that. Uh, often that's also the way how orders get canceled and looking at union us and uh, trend rules. Uh, you just somebody leads the order and that's it. That's not so nice if somebody has business questions around the, the, the canceled orders. And it's also not so nice if you already reported the revenue for, uh, for, for Wednesday. Uh, right, so don't, don't do that. The second option, and uh, again, also don't do that, would be so kind of if the, uh, the, the order was canceled on Thursday or was canceled at any kind of time, you just set the revenue to zero or the, or the card value or whatever, uh, right? So you kind of retroactively correct uh, metrics so that the, uh, well, so that then the meaning of this card value becomes a different one. So it's the not card value by the revenue after cancellations or, or similar. Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that because, because I said before, so this uh, has the problem that if you already reported the revenue for Wednesday, then this will change the revenue for Wednesday, uh, and and people hate that, right? So it's even more difficult if if, if you do financial reporting for your investors, or or for, or for for any kind of other performance reporting, right? So if the if the revenue for April uh, changes depending on when you look at it, that's not so nice because um, well people really hate it. So there are reasons why. Uh, numbers can change retroactively, right? For example, if if you have a funnel and you have your registrations from February, of course, people have to know that the current conversion rate and the current number of one deals can change over time because sales funnels take long, right? The same with attribution. It can happen that um, a click that I made one, one month ago on a website can change its attributed value because uh, later on, with the same cookie, I made an order, right? So, but uh, so there, there are good exceptions where it's okay to change, uh, well, to change metrics over time, but I would be very careful and people don't expect that, right? So also in attribution, you then typically limit the number of look back window, how far you look back to maybe 28 days so that uh, by now the numbers for, for April will stay uh, a kind of constant. Yeah, so, right, so, uh, so once, once you report a metric, make sure it doesn't change if it's a core metric of your company. Um, that's why a third option, and I think this is what most people uh, do then, is to create some sort of uh, reverse order, right? So you basically have all your orders as before. Um, and then for the same order ID, the same customer, uh, in this case, on the same day, uh, well, so basically you repeat all the attributes uh, and then create uh, maybe in another field is called canceled revenue, uh, right? So which, which has then uh, minus 10 euro uh, on that day. And then you define a composed metric of net revenue or whatever revenue after cancellations, which is then the revenue minus the canceled revenue, right? So this is already much better because um, uh, you can look then at the revenue for, for Wednesday will stay the same. Uh, but, the pro and, uh, but the problem is that the, um, the net revenue for Wednesday will still change, right? So this is already a step into the right direction. So you, um, the, the, the kind of top revenue that reported stays the same. 
uh, but if you have something like margins, they will still change over time. And that can be desired or not. But if it's not desired, uh, then do something where you really also tinker with what time is. Right. So uh, here, and then you introduce something like an accounting date where you say, OK, the, this order was uh, on Wednesday, uh, but the cancellation happened on uh, Thursday. Right. And then uh, the, all the rest of the fields are the same. And if you report then the net revenue uh, uh, on this accounting date, then it was minus 10 euro uh, on, on the first day. So, right, so the revenue that happens on first day, uh, then all the cancellations from that day will be removed from that. Um, and uh, well, you could ask whether that makes sense or not, but people usually like that because this makes sure that um, metrics don't change over time. Um, there is so right so this is are these are trivial examples now it will get get um very very tricky very very quickly all right so what you do then with the uh, voucher values of the cancelled order items what you do with the shipping cost and 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 and, and right and so here you see the the core um order item metrics uh, from a, a, a full company hello print and right so hello print they there you can order uh, prints of four cards, and and there is really an ugly amount of stuff that can happen to these orders, right? So they not only can be cancelled uh, or not paid, but they can also they can send them back and say I want to I want to reprint, right? And then there is and there is then for these reprints there is additional shipping costs and revenue and reprint cost. So if you want to know your your, you have a, your revenue, which is somewhere on the top right. Uh, so you have the bottom right or your gross profit it's then really a complex beast of um uh, uh well of, of uh, the interaction of, of different metrics and so there you really have to think for a very long time about how you want to model that so i think here this 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 index card or this um, uh, uh, paper and pen modeling thing took a month uh, for two people to figure out uh, uh, how they want to do these metrics is there questions about it? Good. Then um, there, right, so, so far all the entities we looked at were events that happen uh, in your business somehow. But sometimes you also want to create entities that are just some metrics by day and something, right? So these, these are then the rather weird data sets. Um, they are not to be confused with actual aggregates where you pre-aggregate something. So they have their own uh, kind of right of existence um, because they often combine um, data from different domains, right? So for example, if you don't want to uh, kind of properly uh, attach the, uh, the outside temperature on, on individual order cards, what you can do is that you create a data set that has the revenue per day and the outside temperature per day. And then you can do the same thing as an Excel, right? So uh, you, you basically, in order to compare metrics across different business domains, you put them on the same granularity and put them together so that then uh, you again can do this um, index card thing of, uh, well, going for each card, filtering, grouping, and aggregating them. Another good example is uh, what we often build is a marketing ad performance entity, um, right? Where you first of all, for each day and ad, right? So ad is something, uh, it's the lowest granularity of your marketing hierarchy, right? So typically you have something like channel, partner, and then lots of other things. And ad is the lowest granularity of that, right? So here you would on Monday uh, for at one, two, three, uh, have different channels. So at one is in channel one, at two and three are on channel two. And then you would have somewhere from, uh, from your tracking tool, for example, Google Analytics, have actual sessions that you would already uh, pre aggregate right? So you would build your session logic, uh, your, your attribution and so on. But in the end, per ad and day aggregate them. So you have uh, uh, 200 or 100 sessions then you have 2.3 or 1.2 orders but it's often confusing to people but if you do attribution it can easily happen that you have 2.3 orders for a specific ad right so this is then attributed revenue and 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 whatever other 
metrics you want to have. And then you can put that in relation to things you directly get from Google Ads or Facebook, like impressions, clicks, conversions, and cost. Right? So you would say, okay, uh, the impressions that I saw on Facebook, and here the OS stands for operational systems, are for at one on Monday, 1,000 impressions, and for at three, also 1,000 impressions. The clicks that I saw on Facebook and on Google and so on were, were both 250. The conversions, uh, right? So, and these are the things that these tools are reporting to me um, are four and two. You see it's different from what your attribution says. Um, and, um, and then the cost that I got from these systems was 12 uh, and five euro. Um, then you can do easily do something like an ROI, which is then the number of attributed orders divided by the not attributed costs from the operational systems. Um, right, and so this is really nice. So you, you, you have two different business processes. Well, if you count the clicks happening in Google uh, and Facebook are business process, but you have two different uh, entities that work on different granularities and you combine them. Uh, and this removes the need of kind of pre-computing marketing costs, for example, per session. All right, so because you, you go one granularity higher and because this operation is very costly, right? So, so then, it, then things can happen, right? So this add two had attributed sessions, orders, and revenue um, uh, on that day, but well, for some reason, no impressions or cost uh, in the operational systems. But this add three uh, didn't have, well, sessions in your data warehouse, but there were impressions and cost uh, in Facebook. So there was some problem of linking those sessions to the correct ads, or maybe some tracking problem or whatever. But it doesn't matter because on the level of the channel, which is here channel two, you still have your attributed orders uh, and the cost uh, uh, on that level because you, well, these are defined as aggregations on these columns. Yeah. So, so uh, do that, it makes things easier. Uh, right? So that's, it's, um, it's often done for performance reasons, but also to, 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 to avoid doing a complex business logic like outside temperature per order or marketing cost per session. Is there questions about this? Okay. Then the very last of these patterns uh, um, is something that is well, really synthetic. It's usually some sort of business targets um, uh, data sets, right? So companies often want to know uh, what is for a certain um, uh, for a certain team or for a person or for a country or for whatever. What is the budget? So what did we plan? Where are we compared to that plan? And maybe also some predictions. How, uh, so if everything goes on as as, as currently is. Uh, so how will we how we will end up and then this per per team per person per country per for for a quarter for a month or even a week and certain metrics right and there uh, you can do super weird uh, uh, data sets uh, right so assume that today is uh, we are at the end of May uh, right and then you can do stuff like okay I plan things for a whole team namely the sales team or I plan things for an individual sales representative, in this case, Rob, right? So basically you combine uh, uh, multiple entities uh, in, in, uh, 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 on these cards. You can also have countries there, marketing channels, whatever your business decides to define uh, targets on. Then uh, you can have these targets on multiple timeframes, right? So the first one is for the month of April, uh, and, and the, the, the second and third as well. Um, the, the fourth is for the month of May, uh, and the fifth is for the whole quarter that starts off the, on the 1st of April. Right, so you can well, so not only define these, 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 these um, targets for individual entities, but also time periods, and you can do them for different metrics. Right, So you can say, okay, there is a, uh, the, the first row is a target for uh, the sales team for revenue, uh, and the second one is for Rob for revenue, but Rob might also have a target for a number of leads, right? And so, so the, the metric itself also becomes an attribute. 
And then, uh, and you can take that from a Google Sheet or how, whatever you want to use for, for, for planning. You say, okay, the, the sales team in, in, in May needs to do 1,000 euro revenue and Rob needs to do 300 of those and Rob needs to do five leads and, 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 right? So these, this, these come out. So this is not in the realm of modeling. Somewhere uh, these are defined. But then what you can do is compute the actual values, right? So you then look into your orders table or however you want to define revenue uh, and compute the actual revenue for uh, April. Uh, or you do compute the actual revenue for May, right? So here, in, which is in the fourth rule, um, right? And then you can, you can always uh, uh, compare those. What you can also do, um, uh, if, if that's important, uh, uh, and often it is important that people want to have some sort of forecast uh, specifically for ongoing time periods. Uh, if things continue like they are currently doing, uh, what is the predicted value, right? And so you can do it as simple as just uh, linearly interpolating where you are so far, or you do something like Facebook profit or any kind of other uh, forecasting algorithms to, to come up with these predicted values. Or you do something like uh, really fancy. It, it, it depends on on the how you how, well what what kind of decisions you base on these uh, predicted values. Um, right, and so if, if that's if that's needed by people, uh, and then right, so there's a problem that currently, for example, the month May is ongoing, and also the first uh, the second quarter is ongoing, and so you in order to to correct for uh, how far we in this uh, planning period you can um, uh, compute a, a ratio of how far we in that um, a period. So we are roughly 90% into May uh, and we are 65% uh, into the second quarter of 2021. Is there questions about this? Good. So this is a super weird data set, uh, but it's, uh, it, it's right, so sometimes uh, you want to build these dashboards in, in Tableau. Um, and uh, it's, it's just to show that you still can do proper modeling on those. It's then a bit further detached from actual business processes. So these, these data sets are then a bit more synthetic, but they have their own right. So that's already it. Um, I, I, so, sorry, and if you do that, it's also difficult for people to use them because you always have to set filters then for the the types of the entities for the types of the periods and, uh, and, and the metric. So they are not so self-service ready uh, as other data sets. Um, right, so far, we only talked about um, in, well, individual stacks of cards, uh, and, 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 but an analytical model uh, means that you have lots of these entities and they, they don't live in isolation, right? So. Uh, you right, so in the classic e-commerce case, you have your order items, you have your orders, the customers, and the order items have four products, and the products have a product category, and customers can also have a favorite product category, right? So, um, uh, right, so the, and for me, the, the, the this dimensional modeling is first this metaphor of bringing them onto cards and then onto uh, individual tables, but then, um, but this is then more in the realm of data engineering or analytics engineering, you of course have to bring them uh, uh, into this kind of normalized form, right? So where uh, you, you split your cards onto individual entities, right? So for example, we had our order item card and there we had information about the customer, right? which was the first order date. We had information about the product uh, and we had the payment method of the order. Um, right, and of course, if you build a warehouse, you don't put them all uh, immediately on, on, the, on the order item entity, but you do normalization. And you do that based on analytical needs, but I'll come to that, what that means. Um, this picture that you see here is very disconnected from, from how the data is structured uh, in your source databases. Right? So I, I see often the mistake that people see that in their backend, there is some sort of concept uh, that, that was created there because, well, because to make it easy to non redundantly store uh, um, uh, transactional information, um, right? So these, these entities need to be driven by what you want to report on. 
uh, and, and how you want to look at your business processes and not about how the data looks that you see uh, in, your, in your data sources. Um, and it's very important, it, it, it contains uh, relations between entities. Uh, right? So these are always one to many relationships. Uh, what does that mean? Right? So if, uh, for example, the, an order item uh, has a product, right? or an order item belongs to an order, or a product has a category, or a cat or a customer has a favorite product category or a customer has a first order and an order has a customer and so on, right? So these are typically, these are the relations uh, between these entities. Um, if you have stuff like many to many relationships, then, uh, then you're doing something wrong, then you don't do dimensional modeling, right? So then you need to think about how you, uh, if, you, if, if, you if you have these things, like uh, then you need to see how you create a different kind of granularity of your cards. So, right, so not only have you have to think about your business questions, but you also have to come up with this picture, right? And so this picture, uh, you can draw it on paper. We typically draw it in some sort of uh, drawing tool on a computer, right? But if, if I see these pictures and I see the business questions, then I can easily see uh, whether the business questions can be answered. And then what you also can do is you can challenge uh, these pictures. So in the beginning, they will, they will look very different from uh, what, what you will build eventually. And uh, yeah, so this is the whole idea of this, of this exercise that, uh, uh, that you come up with such a picture. Also, it forces you to think about um, uh, where information belongs to, right? So if you have, right, so you could easily say the product category uh, is a property of the order item, but in fact, it is not. The product category actually belongs to a product um, and you could also see the product category as um, a field on the product itself, like the SKU is or uh, the, the, the name of the product and so on. But in this case, um, you have the concept of the favorite product category of a customer, right? And this motivates of making a separate um, uh, a, a product category entity uh, in this specific case. So if somebody says, I want to segment my customers by favorite product category, then you take the product category out of the product uh, and, and make a separate entity, right? Same with zip codes. Zip codes, can, you can easily see them at a level of orders, but usually uh, you, you want to also have the zip codes of customers or the zip codes of, uh, of whatever, so you make them separate entities, right? So the, that's what I said. Um, uh, so, so how this picture looks like is driven by analytical needs. Karim, you have a question. Yes, <clears throat> two actually. Uh, first, <clears throat> you said it's always a, is a, has a belongs to, but I can see that there is a double relationship between the customer and the order. I am. Yes. So the, 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 it's, it's two directions, right? So that's, that's very normal. So the order was done by a customer, but a customer has a first order, right? That's has often order. Okay. Has, a first, has a first order. Okay. Yeah. And, and the second question regarding what you just said, with removing the, if I want to uh, group by product category, uh, I have to remove the product category from something. <laughs> yes. So if so, this this so here we do dimensional modeling, right? So and this is currently on paper. Uh, later on, it's in the database. Um, and normally, reporting tools don't like uh, these dimensional schemas. So then, if, right, so what you then do is you create a very flattened, a very wide flat order item fact table, where you take all, uh, all the entities, uh, where you link all the entities that you can reach from the order item, which, which in this case are the order, the customer, uh, the product and the product category, and move them into one flat table. Some other tools uh, like Looker or Power BI uh, uh, kind of work well with, with, with these joints, so it depends on, on what you use. But what do you mean by flat table? Um... So in the end, uh, so it depends on the reporting tool, mm -hmm. but some, some reporting tools are also a, a person who wants to have raw data in Excel, doesn't want it, right? So it wants to have the revenue by product category. So they don't want to join the product in the product category. So you kind of make it easier for them by pre by pre-joining uh, these entities together. 
And if I pre-join, this is not a flat table. This is then a flat table. Not. Or, it is. It uh, is. Right, so it, the, the, the point is, I will come to it tomorrow. So you build that um, highly consistent referential uh, uh, integral dimensional model. And afterwards, okay. you can do with, with whatever you want. You can flatten it in, in various ways. Um, uh, then we'll export it wherever. But uh, right, so to, uh, but first, you build this. Okay. To get to the single source of truth. Okay. Okay. Um, oh yeah. It, of course, as I said before, this requires discipline. Uh, all of what I said today is also written in this book, um, and I encourage you uh, to read that. It's it's really boring uh, at times and has also lots of jargon that is well from the early nineties, but still uh, you can read it in an afternoon and. Um, Will, will save you a lot of pain later. Um, it has a, a, quite some outdated advice. Uh, for example, uh, right, so in, in, um, in, in the past, people were doing um, uh, that. Well, doing the star schemas to save disk space, right? So that's not the case anymore. So nobody cares about this or storage space. For for me, it's about single source of truth uh, and conceptual clarity. Um, right, and uh, so this is not correct anymore. Also, there is lots of things about slowly changing dimensions. I would straight away uh, skip those chapters. So it's uh, they are also done for the sake of saving storage space. It's not anymore. Otherwise, it's super excellent. This is from the introduction. Right, so the presentation of data must be grounded in simplicity, if it is to stand any chance of success. And simplicity is the fundamental key that allows users to easily understand databases and software to efficiently navigate databases. In many ways, dimensional modeling amounts to holding the fort against assaults on simplicity. Right? So it's a, it's a tool to, so that for a very long time, you can scale with business complexity and team size if you stay disciplined. That's it. Uh, I think we got uh, quite well through in time. Happy to answer your questions. Uh, I just, <laughs> I still don't get exactly really, may maybe I just don't get the, the, the concept of flattening uh, data into flat tables. Mm -hmm. So like you, you said, uh, we, we have the star, we have the star uh, entity relationship, right? Mm -hmm. then we cannot put it as it is in a database, right? No, you put it as it is in a database. Uh, we put it as it is in a database. You put it as it is in a database, but it's hard to consume for end users. So for convenience reasons and sometimes performance reasons, uh, you flatten them, them again. Okay, yes. Yeah, so but we, but we, we'll cover that tomorrow. But we'll cover that tomorrow. Okay, yeah. Alexei, go ahead. Um, yeah, um, uh, uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, I was uh, wondering, as we were some t uh, time ago discussing uh, event sourcing as a topic, um, if uh, this is something that you uh, also had some experience with uh, and uh, maybe have some feedback, maybe also tomorrow, I don't know. Yeah, I can, I can do that tomorrow, I would say. Right, so event sourcing is a way of, of uh, how data gets to your data infrastructure. Uh, and also a bit about the responsibility for who is to model data, right? So, right, so you could you could say so right, if you read from a database, then you basically reconstruct whatever people thought about how data should look like from tables. Uh, but if 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 microservices or, or other applications in your company send you already kind of nice rich business objects about your orders, about your customers, about whatever other objects you have then that's always nicer. But this is rather than about how data gets to you. Yeah, just because we were talking about uh, events and entities and uh, also talking about like if an order gets cancelled, uh, that, that's also kind of a scenario that you have when you have this event sourcing or events. Yeah, yeah. yeah so that's, uh, I mean, the modeling probably is the something same. that you want to also save for yeah, the yeah. later usage. Yeah. The, the modeling is the same, right? So you have to decide what the business questions are, uh, whether you get then the history of changes from uh, uh, 
well, you can get them from a history table in your backend. You can get them from change data capture. You can get them from event sources. That's independent of, of how you model this. Does that answer your question, Alexei? Yeah, it's all fine. It's all fine. Yeah. yeah, okay. Is there anybody else with a question? I can ask one that I can think of quickly. Then we go to Ying. So Martin, um, yeah, this was great. Uh, I always enjoy this session. Uh, so we have a lot of uh, analysts as well here in the call and data engineers. How do you, can you comment on how do you see the responsibility about data modeling in general in a data team? That's a very good question. Um, sometimes I think, why am I standing here talking about business questions? I'm a technical person, um, but in the end, uh, right, so I'm responsible for building something, uh, well, that is consistent and correct and uh, scales with uh, business complexity and team size. So, so I would say it's, um, it's, a, it's a joint responsibility, but uh, if nobody does this, uh, right, so it's, right, so, uh, right, so you have people who require, um, uh, so who, who gather uh, requirements, and that can be just, okay, I need to know revenue per payment method. Uh, and then it's the poor data engineer who has to then discuss with the analyst what that actually means, or what revenue per outside temperature means, right? So, um, uh, so it's unclear, right? So we, we see data teams where this modeling part is done by a domain experts uh, and, and, and people who are really, um, uh, well, deep, deep uh, in, into the business processes. And then the data engineers get already really well-specified um, uh, data sets or entities and then to build. Sometimes uh, it's, it's just, okay, I need to know revenue per payment method. And then there's the data engineers who are in the lead. Uh, in the end, as I said, if, if, you, if you are not disciplined with, with this modeling, then you create lots of technical debt that is unmaintainable. So I think that's why I'm speaking here as a technical person. So in the responsibility of avoiding technical debt. Okay, thank you. Ying, uh, please go ahead. Thanks, Martin, for the fruitful session. Um, one specific question on the example that you were listing out regarding to the app performance entity. Mm -hmm. um, I record that you recommend saying we slice the data on the very low granularity, which is the ad level. But in some cases, we don't have all the metric associated to the very low granularity saying for this case will be ad. For example, the impression that we don't get on the L level, but rather on the higher granularity. In that um, cases, what would you recommend saying if we get the impression on the aggregate level on the higher granularity, do we create some dummy at ID, ID still sitting in the app performance entity, or you were saying we create other entity that kind of reporting the metric on the other granularity, but it's also hard to maintain to for a source of truth. That's kind of like puzzling me. Actually, um, I want to see your hear your opinion. So right, so it can easily happen that you have an affiliate partner. Uh, where you just get one invoice per month and you're kind of 1,000 euro on that ad. Uh, and then you need to do something, right? And then you could create for each day of the month a fake ad that is, or for the same ad actually, uh, which is then just for that partner and then distribute linearly. Um, or you could try to, right? So if you have multiple ads for that channel, uh, you could then try to distribute them to these ads. So it depends. Um, so it, yeah, so you have to think about it and then find a pragmatic solution how to deal with those. You also have to question whether somebody ever will look at individual ad IDs. People normally people don't. So people optimize their Google Ads accounts in Google Ads directly or in, in Facebook directly, and rather do uh, the the budget allocation on channel and partner level. Uh, but then if you ask them, yeah, okay, I need to know them on ad level. If you want to upload um, predicted customer lifetime value or actual contribution margin uh, to, to Google and Facebook, then you need to have it on ad level. Yeah. 
Does it answer your question? Mm, partially, I would say. I think what is struggling is for me is um, I want to create one source of truth, trying to slice the data as a lowest granularity as we recommend on the L level. However, not all the metric that is so easy and meaningful uh, for us to slice and do the attribution. Um, yeah. I mean, attribution you do on session level, right? So for this at one uh, uh, on Monday, you had two, you have 200 sessions in your data warehouse that you get from your tracking tool. And there you build a relationship to, to, to customers and eventually transactions and then do attribution, right? So basically this ad performance thing here is where you take already your model sessions, um, uh, then group them by ad and day, and maybe also things like country or whatever, um, so that you can combine them with the data you get from your marketing partners, which you only have on ad and day level. Right? So that's the point here that uh, sometimes it's hard to combine things. And so you make them to the right granularity, so the same granularity so that you can compare them. And yeah, for, for your specific questions, uh, this, this thing definitely will look different. Um, and things are always easier if you just have channel and partner. Yeah. Thank you. Philip. Uh, yes, I have one question regarding data joins. So I'm currently working on something to um, presenting a DIO, so days inventory outstanding for inventories. And therefore, we need to combine inventory data with sales data. And there is also a current issue for us that we have uh, the inventory dis uh, is inventory only on the weekly aggregation level. So we only have one entry for every week. And the sales data we have is normally on for each for each day we have sales data. And in the end, we want to have this DIO, this day's inventory outstanding on a monthly level. Yeah. So so, so these, these logistics and warehousing questions you typically do with a history enti entity. Right, so where you have per day and SKU or whatever the unit is you keep in your warehouse. Uh, right, so where you have them, how many things do I have on stock? Uh, how many things uh, do I expect to, uh, to, to still come in or still come out? I don't know exactly what outstanding means, right? So, but basically you compute all these metrics um, per product um, and, uh, and day. And then it sometimes can become a bit tricky uh, if you want to aggregate those on a monthly level, right? So then you typically have to do something that you create an additional field that marks whether the current day is the last day of the month or today, right? So that you don't, right? So if you, if you have the current stuff on stock per day, if you sum that uh, uh, across a month, then you have 30 times the stock that you had on average. So you basically need to filter out, depending on the, the time granularity that you want to look at, you need to filter out all days that are not the last day of a month or not today. Yeah. So, but the, the, I think without knowing too deep what, what you want to analyze, um, a, a flat table with uh, lots of metrics per product and day uh, uh, is always good. Right. So if in, in the project A portfolio, Contorion have they, I think they have a, uh, I don't know where they're here, but they, they have a 50 attribute wide uh, article history or product history table. Um, uh, yeah, so basically whenever you have, or Lampenwelt as well, so if you have rich things that can happen to products, then you need to build something like this. Okay, thanks. Sounds good. Do we have other questions? We have time for one more. Or everybody is already too hungry. Okay, it seems no. So thank you, everybody, for joining. Thank you, Martin. Let's thank Martin again. And enjoy your lunch break, everybody. Yeah, thank see you, you so tomorrow. much. And see you tomorrow. Hope to see everybody at 10. at 10. Yes. Thank you, thank you very much. Oh, yeah.